Welcome to the Weekly Juice Podcast, where we discuss all things real estate, personal finance, investing, entrepreneurship, and the many ways to achieve financial independence. We interview accomplished investors and entrepreneurs with the goal that their stories inspire you to take control of your financial future. Here to get your creative juices flowing while also documenting their own personal investing journeys are your hosts, Corey Jacobson and Ryan Bevilacqua. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice. As always, it's your boys, Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today, we interviewed Avery Heilbronn. He is a 28-year-old millionaire real estate investor who went from zero to $1.5 million worth of net worth in just four years. He played, uh, I I mentioned this early on, but he played soccer in college, which I think is really cool. And then um, did a little bit of investing in real estate in Boston and then moved his way down to North Carolina. He's got a mix between long-term rentals, short-term rentals, and uh, kind of a mixed bag. He does some things on social. He's got an online course, but we had a blast with him on the show today. He's a young cat, kind of like us, and doing a lot of things. So we were excited to have him on. Yeah, like-minded dude. Uh, we I felt the synergy between our scenarios, right? He's 28. We're in our early 30s. I love saying early 30s. I'm probably going to say early, early 30s still we're like maybe 40. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're really early 30s. No, we are. But for now. Yeah, it's going to come. But no, if he, he Avery's cool. And he has so short term rentals. We mentioned like he has a short term rental that's like in a golf on a golf course Pinehurst. actually Pinehurst. Yeah, so it's like a, a very popular golf course where he can take advantage of people that are having weddings there, people that are golfing. He's got one like a glamping site in the middle of nowhere too. Uh, he's got his. He tells a story about his uh, duplex that gained three hundred thousand dollars in net worth or in in equity. By doing, you know, small fixes along the way, he kind of redid the whole property. He was able to cash flow on that. And that's kind of how he springboarded his first deal into his second deal. And, you know, the dude's kind of got it all going on at 28. Still got his W2 job too, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, he he got the property under contract through networking actually. And it was only his first deal. He he was feeling kind of set back after two, only literally only two months of analyzing deals. We're like, dude, if you can get something that fast... And something, I think he said he did an FHA loan, 3% 3 down, something like that, for 525 grand. It's now worth upwards of 800,000. It's only been about three years, I think, that he's had it. So cool story. He talks about house hacking a lot. He he teaches people how to buy their first rental. Just a a cool dude. When he's still here, super relatable. Like Corey mentioned, he still has a W 2 job. So for those that are, you know, seeking financial independence, he actually reached financial independence and he said, you know what? I'm just going to keep working, stacking the stacking the cash up. So my end goal, his end goal, which is very cool, he's like, I just want to be a stay at home dad and be able to provide all the opportunities for my kids to do what they want when they want and and try new things. So I thought it was admirable and seems like a cool dude. Yeah the the coolest thing about this whole episode is that it's vi- like we can look at it as such an attainable goal. Like you buy a couple properties a year. Obviously, you got to have the niches and you got to find the right people to put in place. Then he built a social media following. And, you know, the sky's the limit for somebody like Avery. So without further ado, let's bring him in. Let's do it. Avery, officially welcome to the Weekly Juice podcast. Corey and I are so excited to have you on the show, man. Um, just doing a little brief background on you. Before the show, we heard your episode on Bigger Pockets Money. Loved your interview with Scott and Mindy. And then uh, heard that you got into real estate. Well, you played a, did a little stint of soccer in college um, and then... Invested into real estate a little bit in Boston, then moved down to North Carolina. And now I think at age 28, you're up to 1.5 million of net worth, which is pretty incredible. So um, needless to say, you have an exciting story and we're excited to share it with our listeners. So thanks for joining us on the show today, man. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for reaching out. Always uh, uh, happy to talk about real estate. I don't talk about too much else. So <laughs> Yeah, we know you're feeling <laughs> So uh, talk us through your story um, or take us back, I should say. I know we talked previously about uh, where you went to college. I believe you grew up in Vancouver, then played a little bit of soccer in college. Um, take us through the story of kind of your decision to move into real estate um, on whether it was on side, full time and kind of yeah, the so story. From Vancouver, I always wanted to play pro sports. So I thought college soccer in the States was the way that didn't pan out. Graduated, got a job in the Boston area, um, ended up just happening upon a book and the book was about retiring on real estate and it mentioned your pockets, the idea of house hacking, you know, listening to Brandon Turner, bigger pockets podcast, 
really just pushed it on from there. Did my first house hack, second house hack, and then ended up moving down to North Carolina after being in the Boston area, got into short-term rentals a bit. Um, also did some more long-term rental down here with partners. Um, and now just, you know, continuing to try to expand on that portfolio and uh, achieve financial freedom a year or so ago. Uh, but I still do have that day job just trying to fuel the growth of the portfolio. Awesome. I, one of the cool things that we, we learned about you just by doing some research is that you had a, uh, you know, you started out, you were making $65,000 at your W-2 job, which is a modest salary, obviously nothing to, to you know, sneeze at. But then in one of your pod or one of your YouTube videos, it was probably six months ago, you might be making more now. You mentioned that you got that income all the way up to $400,000 a year. I'm wondering if you could talk about what it was like buying real estate on a $65,000 a year salary in the beginning when you're house hacking and what you did to kind of scale that up because it's in four years or maybe five at this point now, like it's it's pretty remarkable to grow your income from $65,000 to four or 500,000. Yeah, yeah, and I will I will say that is the gross income. Um, of course, that can be different. I know when people are talking about their W-2 job, it's typically in gross income numbers, but maybe with rental income, it's uh, more of the cash flow piece, but the the big piece of that when I was just starting out was, yeah, it was not the highest salary, not the lowest salary, probably a little bit harder to hit that salary with a, a duplex house hack in the Boston area today. Um, but really, I was just on the weekends reading library books and getting groceries. And that was basically what I spent my money on. Uh, and then I would go to meetups, try to talk to as many investors as possible, pumped every penny I could into savings and got a side hustle just to try to really kickstart getting that house at. Cause as soon as I read about it, um, I knew that's what I wanted to do. That was the action step I needed to take. Cause originally I thought, Hey, I needed 20% down on a 600,000 to a million dollar place when I was in Boston. And that didn't feel very achievable on my salary. Um, so when I knew it was a bit more attainable. I just tried to do everything I could to, to get to that point. And then, you know, it, it's interesting to say, goes from 65 to 400 feels like a really big jump but it's just very incremental every year every quarter or whatever trying to add new income streams new property it's not crazy fast um it's been like one or two properties each year uh and then i've added social media to the mix still doing some side hustles still have my job and you know all along while also increasing the salary of my job trying to change companies change jobs within the companies all those small things really add up yeah, Avery, I think one of the cool things about your story is it's very uh, attainable for people that are listening. It like sounds like somebody else can do this or to grow from a zero net worth to over 1.5 million in that four-year range. And when you hear it, it's like, how is this really possible? But you only buying a couple of properties in that time frame or a few, right? You know, one couple a year, uh, it's very doable for people. So I, I want to hear like, what was that mindset shift like? Because I was I was watching one of your YouTube videos and I was actually laughing because you said that you were all pumped on like your first job, I guess right out of college. You get there like two hours before your boss. And like you're like, then at the by the end of the day, you you know, you did everything you needed to do in like way less time. You get home and you're like, All right, I guess this is it for forty years, I'm gonna do this. And like yeah. I think a lot of people have had that thought. So my my question is roundabout way to get here is like when did it shift for you to be like, oh, I got I have to buy assets. House hacks the first way to start. And then how did it scale from there? Like what was going on in your head? Yeah. So I, I've always been frugal. I've always been interested in finding ways to make money. I've never really understood what those ways are. I wasn't really surrounded by it. Um, like you said, I got to that job. I think it was 7 a.m. one day, worked out before, super pumped. My boss brought me my computer about two and a half hours later. Um, and then it, it was just so boring. You know, when you're so bored, you're just hungry. Like that was how I felt my day job was for about six months. So I knew, I just knew there had to be something else. Uh, and luckily, luckily I sprained my ankle and I ended up having a lot of free time. So that's why I went to the bookstore, uh, and picked up this book, retire on real estate by Kai Anderson. And that's kind of really where it shifted for me. Cause I noticed that I was kind of had an inkling about real estate as an idea or um, being a landlord. Because when I was in college playing soccer, we had a soccer house. I remember the guys telling me that they rented this really crappy three bedroom for about 3,500 bucks. And I thought that was wild. Um, so I wanted to be, you know, on the other end of that where I'm receiving that income. 
But then reading this book, hearing about house hacking, just thought it was way more attainable. Um, so that's really where the mindset shift, knowing that it was possible with what I already had in life. Very cool. I think I want to talk about you partnering up with people. I think when you mentioned you came down to North Carolina to scale your portfolio a little bit, you jumped in with other people. I think for some starting out, they might have the knowledge, but lack the funds or they have the funds, but they lack the knowledge, right? There's usually one that's kind of lacking. Can you talk about finding those partners, how you knew they were the right people to go into business that were thought they were, and then how that helped you scale your portfolio? Because I think a lot of people or a lot of our listeners, as I mentioned, are lacking one of the two and they're looking to join forces with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, either you have the money or you have the knowledge or time. Um, so with that one specifically, I found that because I was, I had a track record built up, you know, people around you in your inner circle, family, relatives, friends, whatever, um, might think you're kind of crazy or weird with what you're doing. And then they saw that things were going well. Uh, so then eventually they said, Hey, we see that you're doing this. We have some funds set aside. We don't know how to do it. So can you find the deal? Can you manage the property? Can you get it into it? So this one was more of a family and friends. Um, hasn't been through relationships that I've built yet. I did actually originally back in 2020, um, kind of initially partner up with a husband and wife. And we had a 23 unit under contract in New Hampshire. Uh, ended up backing out of that because of a variety of reasons. They lied about rents and stuff. But through that process, I realized that I just thought it was a cool idea to get a partner and buy a larger building. Um, but I realized those people were not aligned with the goals that I had. So I was glad I had that experience. I'm definitely a bit more picky about the partners that I would get into a deal with. So I guess any advice in that realm is, you know, if you're getting into bed with someone financially, you're, if you get a, a multi-million dollar loan or any loan, it's uh, you know, a pretty expensive decision. So you want to make sure that those people are transparent with you and you know what you're Yeah, I think that's do. important to bring up because a lot of times it, people hear it on a podcast and they just, they're like, hey, I just need to get a, a deal under contract. I need to start my portfolio. And they're very quick to partner with people. We've we've kind of found that along the lines, you kind of get burned in certain aspects, but from not knowing people, like it's it's easy to trust in today's world. And especially when you see a lot of people, even just on social media with their digital resume, they could have X amount of followers and they look like they have it all going on. And maybe they don't exactly have it lined up the way you think. So it's just funny to to talk about it because um, I know everybody pushes, get a partner, get a partner, get a partner, but you really need to vet them. And even for us, I think we still feel like we have a, I think it's a um, a bit of the, uh, I forget the phrase, but basically like you, the fear of not wanting to waste other people's money. Yeah. And it's, it's I want to treat it better than my own money, right? So like we have family friends that are just like, hey, chomping at the bit, what do you guys have going on? Will you do this for me? Or do you want to go in to deal together? There's like a two part, kind of play there, which one is, hey, do you really want to be in business with that person for 30 years on a, on a 30 year mortgage, right? Because if something goes wrong, they're going to go to you because you have the knowledge and you're you're playing with their cash. And then the other hand, it's like all the dumb questions on a daily basis is like, do you really want to be handling that? Oh, this mini thing goes wrong. You're like, dude, that's really nothing because you've, you've had that experience happen to you five times over the last X amount of years. And the other, the, the flip side of it is, um, well, aside from the customer service aspect of like listening to people, it's that fear of, oh shit, I got to make sure this works. And it's treat that cash even better than my own. And so um, for us, it's like, at what point are we going to be comfortable to be like, hey, here, take this exact deal and let us run it together. Right now we have other partners that we have as the GPs running the deals because we trust them to do the boots on the ground a little bit more so than we do. So we'll bring our cash, right? And that's and then we can kind of learn the process along the way. So there's just so many, um, I guess, arms to this thing and so many different facets that people can get involved in. But I will caution people to the best thing you could possibly do is learn it yourself. And even if you don't go execute solely by yourself, it'll teach you the questions to ask when you go find a partner. I would say risk your own funds first too. Like that that's what we did. We risked our own funds. We realized that that was working in the, the form of duplexes in the form of tri or single family homes and then in the form of syndications. And then once our money was involved, we're like, it's an easier conversation with other people that want to get involved. Hey, we're also in investors in this deal too. Okay, you guys have some knowledge. You've done X, Y, Z. It makes me feel more comfortable as opposed to a lot of gurus out there that you watch on social media that call themselves syndicators. And in reality, they might not even be investing in these deals. They might just be, I forget the term. And I just learned about this the other day. And I'm going to, I'm going to have to think of it, but it's basically like partnering with somebody, but you don't even really have any 
skin in the game and you're just like plugging people in where for us, we have like a few operators that we work with on the syndications that we really know, like, and trust and have vetted them as friends. So roundabout, you know, <laughs> a lot to cover there, but I'm, I'm curious, let's talk about your portfolio and scaling that and mm-hmm. going from, a you know, duplex, duplex, you're in the Airbnb space. Like, what do you feel like your niche is now as you start to grow it even bigger? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good question. I mean, I like doing some of the Airbnb stuff. My girlfriend's really big into the interior design and and all that, so that's uh, been fun to do together. I definitely prefer the long term rental small multis. Um, I have been looking at some of the commercial multi on the smaller side. Um, like I offered out on a nine unit recently, didn't get that one, but I I definitely prefer. It's pretty simple um, and easier to pull off. But uh, like the Airbnb is pretty fun like making a cool place to stay. So I wouldn't say I, you know, am going hard on either direction. I like both, uh, which is probably a bad thing, but just right now, kind of what I'm feeling out. Well, I think in today's market, it's like you kind of have to be to do both, right? You don't have to, right? Some people are like, I buy two bed, one bath in this area that have a detached garage and I do X, Y, Z. And they're like really maybe all in on real estate where we're talking with three people in this room where we all have our full-time jobs still. So it's kind of hard to be like that expert where we're going to get beat out by people who are like doing it all day long, like some of our friends. So I think it's great. Like I have, Ryan, I have long-term, we have short-term, we're in syndications. I feel like it's kind of the the lessons you learn along the way that teach you in what direction to go at what time. Because now it's hard. I don't even know where to go really to look for properties that are long-term cash flowing, unless we're going to go significantly further, like out of state in the Northeast, we can't even really find them anymore. So unless you're doing burrs and with the interest rates now, it's really tough to do that even. So are all your properties, are you trying to focus in the local market in the North Carolina market as you look, or what's your strategy there? Yeah, I've been looking mainly in the North Carolina market for sure. There's a lot less multifamily stock down here. Um, probably just my own bias. I've been more interested in multifamily just because I was in Boston and they're just about everywhere, the small multis. In terms of those deals that are the, let's say five to 30 unit range, um, there's a decent amount of that stock around here. And so I've been building up some broker relationships as well. Um, I probably should be doing a bit more direct to seller marketing, but I just don't feel like I prioritized that specifically, you know, getting all the good data and cold calling. I did a little bit of that cold calling two, three years ago. I don't love it. Um, should probably find someone who likes it a lot more than me. Well, I will say there's, uh, what we were talking about, there's a lot of our friends that do this full time, right? And they don't have their W-2. They're all in on real estate. They hire cold callers so they don't have to do it themselves. And they basically get a warm lead past them. And they end up closing the deal, which I think is great. If you have the funds, just like a, a way to cut through some of the fat. Um, but yeah, we, as Corey mentioned, we have a, a bit of a, a, a blended mix portfolio too. And it's good to get experience in all of it, I would say, right? Like we have one Airbnb that we currently own together, just him and I, then we're in two larger Airbnb, I almost call them syndications, but they're just, we pulled money with, with a bunch of other people, right. To take down a bigger deal. And mm-hmm. those are cool. Like we're hands off on those, but then in the long term, our like bread and butter, I think is the long term, um, multifamily or the uh, the residential and I think it's just a safer play for long term right I've I get kind of more definitely more stressed out on the uh on the Airbnb front because there's so much or short term rental I should say there's so many different factors that go into it from the marketing side to the decorations to running the numbers and and vacancy and like every, like I'm preaching to the choir here but just the it's such a more simple task to go find a long term whether it's multifamily or single family and just kind of one to two a year, right? And then eventually, if you do a couple of bears in there, you'll snowball your portfolio by just your experience and the network growing and all that. And I think we've gotten slightly away from that. And I think we're, we're looking to pivot back a little bit more because we've, we've played the field <laughs> in a couple of different areas and it's fun, but it's shiny object syndrome. So we realized, hey, we're not going to go all in on like he and I having 15 of our own Airbnbs. We're just not going to do it. We'll have a couple. Um, but we'd love to have, you know, large multifamily um, apartment complexes and things like that, things like that. Some like duplexes, triplexes here and there. So it's just funny what you think you're gonna want to pursue, and then until you do it, and you're like, damn, I actually don't like that as much as I thought I would. 
or I'd rather just hire someone that's better than me to go do it, right? And so that's why definitely different avenue there that I'm talking about, but hiring a property manager too. I want to kind of go into that and see what your thoughts are. We decided at one point during our W-2 stints that, hey, we, we can't handle managing tenants and the relationships and then collecting rent and all that. And like, if shit hits the fan, it just comes on us, right? So we pivoted and hired a property manager and it's been a godsend for a number of reasons, including the biggest, which is, we talked about a couple episodes ago, one of our duplexes burned down. So they guided us through the entire process. So if that's not happening to you, dude, we can help if it ever does. Uh, it sucks. Hopefully, it never, does. Hopefully it never does. <laughs> but um, needless to say, we love it and we're, we're thankful that we found the right one. It went through a pretty big, big vetting process. What are your thoughts on it? Are you being that you're in multiple markets? Are you a self-managed guy or are you hiring out? Yeah, so I still self-manage everything. The thing that I probably spend the most time on would be the Airbnbs, the uh, duplex and triplex up in the Boston area. I still self-manage even though I live down here in North Carolina. It's just because um, there's not really a lot going on. I probably spend like a couple hours each week on those specifically or each month. Um, and it's mainly because I, you know, got into them, fixed them up pretty good. There are very minimal maintenance issues just because fix it up right when I bought them. And then, um, one of my really good buddies is my handyman. So that helps a lot. Uh, he's pretty reliable, um, as well as all the other vendors and stuff. And then the big piece, which obviously is pretty difficult in certain markets, but the market that is Boston tenants are pretty used to paying a broker fee. So if I need to rent the place out, I don't have to pay anyone to do that. It's just the tenant is paying the person that is listing the property before me. So that also makes it really easy for that specific location. Um, the Airbnb is, yeah, they're kind of a pain, like you were talking about shiny object syndrome a little bit at getting into that because so many people were talking about it throughout the pandemic. Um, but th th it's not terrible. I think I would want to get to a point where I just have a lot of reviews so that some of, if things aren't as good and the quality can't be there, you know, you get a few four stars, not really a big deal because you're so padded with five star reviews. Um, but probably at that point, once I get to a certain amount of reviews, I just like to hire more VAs to handle the messaging, talk to some of the vendors. Cause you know, you have people who are doing the trip running, you're talking to the cleaner. Um, you're just thinking about the pricing. There, there's just a lot more going on with that aspect. So I really dislike that management, um, but the long-term rental stuff's been fantastic. I I feel like I rarely hear from anyone, and they always say that I'm an awesome landlord. And I feel like I don't don't do much other than answer their texts when they say something's broken. Yeah, I mean, I think it's when you have experience in both, you realize how much less work there is in the long term, even though you thought it was a lot in the beginning, right? And then you go in the short term, you're like, whoa, dude. There's literally layer after layer after layer, and every day there seems to be something. People are like, oh, yeah, I can self-manage a couple hours a week. It feels like a couple hours, but it's to the normal person, it's it's not one or two hours. It's going to be 10 plus hours, depending on what it is, right? Whether it's pricing, whether it's uh, communication. So I did want to, I heard you um, talk about hiring VAs. I want to talk about that too, because to us, it all seems kind of norm like normal talk. But if someone hearing this just started in their portfolio, like, what the heck's a VA? Um, which obviously we know it's a virtual assistant, but how did you go about sourcing yours? Where are they from? And then how did you go about training them? Cause I recently went, th sorry to like share another story, but I went through, we were going to have a, uh, a VA run our social for our hospitality company. And I went through like a two hour training with her and it just, I realized the, the language barrier was too much and it wasn't going to be the final product that I, I thought we deserved. And like truly for the cash that we were spending to, to go have it have her manage it. I was like, dude, I'll just do it. It's it's going to take me less time. And that was one task. I was like, okay, maybe the creative side is something I wouldn't hire, hire out for more. So just like the A to B, like super easy tasks that I can really show them black and white, how to do things. So I'm curious your thoughts and then just talk us through your process of, of hiring out. Yeah. So maybe, maybe I misstated there. I don't have any VAs yet, uh, in the, in the real estate space, but, um, just like once I have enough reviews and I feel like the cool, like, like you said, it would take a long time to actually train someone to do it properly and no one's going to do it the way you do it. Uh, it's just going to be that way and also language barrier. But, um, I know people who do it just use Upwork or Fiverr or sites like that. Uh, I think there's another one that's specific to the Philippines. Maybe you're familiar with that one. Yeah. It's uh, online jobs.ph. I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Um, I do have, or I'm in the process of getting a VA for 
my rental property program, my mentorship program. So just someone who can go in the DMs and, you know, cold DM people reach out, say, Hey, are you interested? Get them on a call. Um, with that specifically though, I was in the process of trying to hire someone and I found that it was difficult, like you said, but, uh, I did initially work with a company who helped me build a funnel for, for the, uh, program. So they also offer a service of, Hey, you pay us. We've already trained these people. They've done this for other people. They might do it for one or two more. Uh, we just add them all onto you and they'll help you out. So let me ask you this. That's great that you brought that up. So pivoting from kind of the VAs, there, there are companies that kind of have everything in house, right? And they do, they help with content. They help with funnels. We have so many people reaching out to us in our DMs. I know you do too. Once you get over that like 10K follower amount, people are like, oh, I see what you're doing. It's great. How Here's what I edit video or like I, I click funnels, whatever it is. I, there's one gentleman that has a very popular comp company with uh, Damon, one of the sharks from Shark Tank. I forget his name off the top of my head, but he's a click funnel company that we're thinking about potentially looking into. Who did you use? And if you're not comfortable sharing the company, no problem. But just like, how did you vet it? Because there's so many people that'll that'll attack you via DM and say, hey, here's what we have. And to take the time to talk to all of them when they have very similar um, programs, it's not. I'm just not sure who to go to because we have a lot of things on the horizon that I want to make sure it's going the right way and we're, we're funneling it properly. Yeah, yeah, I totally feel that with all the DMs. I think this was probably the fifth company that I had spoken to on a whole Zoom call, sales call before I actually said okay to this one. Probably two or three of those five uh, when I asked to speak with someone who had actually gone through the program or that they worked with, that was to them like, oh, that's weird. Why would they want to know that? And to me, that's a huge red flag. You know, I would at least want to talk to someone who you've worked with before so that I know it's real. Uh, with them specifically... It's called social closers, by the way. Um, it's it's been it's been pretty decent. You know, they built the front to back end funnel. They made me fill out a worksheet. The whole thing was like your irresistible offer, so they could kind of get your tone, your brand coloring, and all of that good stuff. Um, I had built the course beforehand, so they also took a lot of that information to build out the funnel. And it's basically what I've gotten. All right, like. The amount of effort that I've put it in or the more questions that I've asked, they've never been annoyed by it. But if you don't take advantage of it, they're not going to help you anymore. Um, it did feel a little bit sales call sleazy based on what actually had happened from when I initially spoke to them. And maybe that was just because of the what they had said and, and what I didn't realize I had to do, which was fill out this information and really do a lot more upfront work than what they had said. Because he was basically like, hey, you know, you pay your money. Um, you're, you'll get it back within a month, no problem, pretty much guaranteed. But that's not really what happened overall, though. It was still a, a positive experience, and I have liked working with them. But there's still some things that maybe I just haven't put enough money into it to have it really be running. But there's other people who are part of their program that are making a bunch of money and doing really well, and they are specific to the real estate space. So I also like that piece. So with that, too, let's talk about building out your course and like, uh, you have to film yourself. You have to write a curriculum or whatever it is. Did you? I think there's Teachable, Kajabi. There's a couple of different things out there. Gumroad. I don't. I don't know exactly which one. There's. I mentioned a bunch of those things are for like digital assets. But how did you take us through the basically the process, dude? Start to finish. I know it's to buy your first rental, right? So for us, we have that knowledge too. Just throwing it out there, and we're like, hey, we need to freaking build a course. There's people that want this, and they want it packaged up with a bow on it, and we just have not done it. It's been well over a year that we've been talking about it. So. Maybe you can talk us through just the process of like someone that would want to start a similar course or something out there. What did it take to put your ideas on paper and then bring it to life? Yeah. So obviously knowledge and credibility, I think is important. Personally, there's probably a ton of courses out there where the person doesn't have either of those things, um, which you would probably get found out, maybe make a quick buck originally if you, if you have a solid following, but I wouldn't recommend that as a long-term sustainable thing. Uh, so pretty much I just, I had a friend who had created a course and his was more about day trading, but he was legit, not one of those fake day trading guys. Uh, and he basically just created a bunch of PowerPoints, like everything he could think of on paper as to, and in chronological order, basically of how it would work if, if you were to go through it yourself and then made all of the PowerPoints and ended up, you know, you're in the corner talking over the PowerPoint. You're also trying to offer extra information or have um, resources. Like, for example, I have my cash flow calculator. 
go over it in one of the videos and use a real life example. Um, so pretty much, yeah, just, I was thought in my head, if I were to buy a property, what's everything I need to know, wrote down all the chapters. And then I made uh, in Canva just every single PowerPoint and try to add as much information as possible. And then sometimes I would film it and it would sound horrible or I'd think, hey, I need to add this extra information. So I just go back and film it again um, and try not to talk too much because sometimes you can get repetitive, which I'm sure you guys are aware of too. So that, that was pretty much it there. And then originally I thought I would put it on Teachable. Um, but then this company reached out to me and I think it's on click funnels is how they set it up. So you know, you get the funnel, you can watch a video of me, then you can either sign up for a phone call or just immediately purchase the, the thing. And you get all the stuff going straight to your inbox and then you can start watching the course right there. I also do offer a discord group chat with it. So just people can ask questions because people are most likely going to have questions. And then, the, you know, a lot of people will do Facebook groups as well with that sort of thing. Um, and then I also do a quick 15 minute one on one phone calls because like, hey, you know, I just want to talk about something real quick. I think that helps a lot because when I was trying to figure this stuff out on my own, too, and talking to people who are more mentors in the space, just you, you just want to hear someone who's experienced say something really quick in a, in a chat or someone on video doesn't always do it. Do you feel like it's worth your time coming from the creator side, right? I, first of all, it sounds amazing for someone that wants to go in and buy it, right? It seems like it's got many layers to it, but for, for the creator side and it's, do you feel like it's worth the time, energy and effort to do that? Are you profiting enough to recycle that, those funds and put it into future deals? Cause for us, we're, we're, we're all tight on time, right? Everyone is. But so I'm wondering, is that worth it to you do you think it's worthwhile that you were able to scale your income up enough based off this one thing or is it something like you might have if you could go back in hindsight just pivot to a different um your time energy and effort into something else um probably i would do it but i would do it differently just because of the specific niche that i'm in i am mainly talking to people about house hacking uh yeah it is about buying your first rental but house hacking specifically most people are pretty short on funds or you're trying really hard to save a lot uh so you know it has ranged between 500 and a thousand bucks for the program which thinking about it it's very valuable in my opinion for the price but you know i might have in my case not paid for that either uh but then you're in a different space like Airbnb, for example, people might have funds because they have a hundred grand to buy a property, furnish it and make it look really good. Spending one to 2000 bucks or maybe up to five, 10, depending on what is being offered. I know people who offer that, uh, that's really nothing to them because they just want to learn quickly rather than not figure their stuff out until they're doing it. So I would, yes, do it again, but I'd probably do it in a different niche is, is really my answer. It sounds like you got to be really, really specific with the courses too. I think that's what I, that what we've learned. Um, we have a, a friend. Um, you mentioned um, trading Austin Silver, who's he's amazing, man. Like he's got over one hundred and twenty thousand followers. He does the trading stuff, and he has like a all of the the layers of the the course, and then the the one on ones, and he does the um, I don't know. You won't call them conventions, really, but like he'll do the, yeah, like the meetups where he'll go to a specific city and he'll do all these podcasts and trainings. So. It's there's so much money in that game because it really is valuable, I, I believe. So it's something that we haven't quite ironed out, like what our courses would specifically be like. But it's cool to hear from you that it's it's worked and um, just you know specific ways that you go about it. One of the things I wanted to touch on, just more more maybe more granularly about your portfolio, is your if you could walk us through a specific deal that has worked out really well for you. Um, maybe if you want to talk about you know, the purchase price, maybe work that you did to it, what what it rents for, and just some details on it. That way you can give people an idea of what it was like for you to build this portfolio over the last couple of years. Yeah, sure. I can talk about the the first duplex there. Um, so I bought that in the Boston area. That was a, a four bed, one bath upstairs duplex, two bed, one bath downstairs. That was 525,000. And that happened to be my exact pre-approval number. Uh, and the reason I got it under contract for that amount is because originally it was 550. There was a cash offer who I've actually met the guy since, um, came in at 535. He backed out of the deal for, I, th I think he couldn't actually get the funding. He might've been going in with hard money or something. And so the guy who was selling it 
was doing a 1031 exchange, which I didn't know at the time, but because I'd been going to a bunch of networking events and he had a time crunch, the real estate agent who was listing it, who I knew, uh, just called me and said, Hey, before this goes back on market, and he looked at it, do you want it? So that kind of fell into my lap and worked out pretty well, uh, especially at a time where I felt like I was in a difficult spot uh, and maybe not patient enough because I'd only really been looking for two months, but I just really wanted to get it done. Uh, so bought that at one, 525, 3.5% down payment. I also got the seller to pay probably 70 or 80% of the closing costs. So there was that good seller credit that saved some money. And that was... Plus, I had a little bit of money left over for some renovations about... I I didn't really buy with any reserves, I guess I'll say. So I did some cosmetic renovations to the place. It was pretty disgusting, um, full of like mouse poop. And the basement had a bunch of gross vegetables just chilling there. And then the backyard had pools of dirt, like literal kiddie pools of dirt and garden. Uh, So it was a very interesting, smelly place. And I was super excited, but the day I opened the door and realized I had to live there in about a month, I decided to get (laughs) to work. Uh, So painted, flooring uh, at first, same thing happened upstairs. And then over time, as I was living there, because I no longer had a housing payment, I was able to save more. Did the bathroom. Um, I had to do some electrical too. I didn't do that personally. And then had to get the roof done like a year or two later. Uh, and then I think a couple of years after that, I ended up doing the entire like combo heating and hot water system. Um, about half of that ended up being paid for by a grant, which was pretty awesome from, from the state. But in terms of the numbers, bought it at 4.125% that, uh, interest rate. So that was about a $3,300 mortgage. The upstairs rented for 2,400. My girlfriend paid 400 in the two bed. And then we had a roommate who paid 800. So it was like a little bit over the mortgage covering its expenses more or less. Um, and then refinanced that one into a conventional went down to today. It's a 2830 mortgage. Um, cause I've also removed the PMI and the upstairs rents for 3,200 and the downstairs rents for 2000. 2830. That's That's your payment to a $2,830. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So this, this absolutely crushes. And then you, you also, uh, what did the, what did the refi, what did it appraise for on the refi? So a year ago when I dropped the PMI, which was technically not an appraisal, they did one of those broker opinion um, things. It, w- it went for 800 or it appraised for 800. I think it's probably worth a bit more than that. Just looking at comps, um, especially today. Now that's been about a year later, but yeah, it was pretty crazy appreciation since 2019. Yeah, this is wild. And that's, I, I wanted to get granular on it because I wanted to get specific about this i know you didn't put anywhere near three hundred thousand dollars into the property right you let natural appreciation come and then also like kind of do it this is a great way for people to get into um into uh real estate like the person who bought a duplex that i just sold is i hope he does this where he is living in one unit renting out the other but then like making small fixes along the way i mean obviously if you're in boston you're in that area it's going to appreciate significantly if you do nothing but to create that three hundred thousand dollars spread in equity, and you're making money on it each month, it must have been a pretty eye-opening experience. Considering it was your first deal, to be like, "Oh, I can do this again. Like, I can definitely duplicate this." Or, and and I know you did. So, um, and you didn't do it over like a crazy period of time, right? Like, it was it just step by step. You were living there. How long did it take you to do all those renovations? Uh, so at first, I was this. This is probably the hardest I've had worked in terms of like time um because i bought the property and then every day after work for probably a month i was there from like five to nine i'd go home and make dinner go to work same thing weekend was about 6 p.m on friday to whatever like 5 6 p.m on sunday you know time to buy groceries and that was that was definitely a haul that was a lot of effort just because i one had never done anything handy before and two it was a it was a pretty decent amount of effort to get it all done but yeah after that once i was living there um to do the rest of it it was pretty much over a year or two uh to get the rest of that done and i did end up hiring people for obviously the you know roof i'm not going to do that myself i wouldn't know how uh and some of the electrical panel stuff so some of the a lot of the non-cosmetic stuff was really what was left to do so it, it really, you know, just because I'm saving a lot of money and then the cash flow was good, it was pretty easy to 
to spend on a lot of that stuff. Cool. Um, as we wind down before, before we get to towards the end of the show, I want to ask you about your Airbnbs and how you specifically decided to go into the area that you did. Cause Airbnb is, it's, it's challenging. Uh, we love it because we have a good system in place and like, we also own, a a part of the management company. So we have all of those processes, but I'm curious about where your Airbnb is and how you decided on that market and what told you that a lot of people want to travel here and that it would be a good investment for you. So the first one is in a town called Pinehurst, North Carolina. If you're familiar, um, they have the U S open there now every five years. So honestly, the reason why I looked there is because one, I knew I was moving to Durham Two, I wanted to use a second home loan and it has to be a certain amount of distance away. And that's about an hour, an hour and a half away from me. Uh, and three, I did a podcast and a guy said he had an Airbnb there. So that's kind of <laughs> why I looked into it. Um, that housing stock was pretty inexpensive relative to the quality of it. So, you know, you might be like 350 to 500 for a standard property. Um, so I thought that wasn't bad. And then all the homes were built like 90s. Well, there are some older ones, but a majority were 90s or later. And they're in pretty solid shape because it's a pretty country clubby um, uppity place. So people took care of their stuff. Um, so I figured it'd be lower maintenance on that end. So all those things kind of checked the box. And then they did end up moving the, or are planning to move the U.S. Golf Hall of Fame there. There's a ton of golf courses. Like I said, the U.S. Open every five years, you can charge like 30000 for that week. Um, so that seemed like, I know it's pretty wild. Um, but- so you, a lot of, you get a lot of guests that go there that are playing golf. Like that's a big, like golf weekends, long weekends, maybe bachelor party. That is that tightly your clientele? Pretty much. And then you also have weddings just because golf courses can be a place where people have weddings. And then my property is specifically on one of the golf courses. Like you're sitting out on the back deck, you can see the tee box on uh, one of the holes. So that's, that's a bit of the draw there. I mean, there are other houses on golf courses, but um, that's one of the draws. Just kind of goes to show with Airbnb if you do it right. Like you can really have an Airbnb in any area that's not like... I don't want to, I don't want to pick on a city, but <laughs> like that's not in the middle of nowhere. Right. Because there's always going to be people traveling there. If you're near a university or college, if you're near a hospital, there's people traveling there for like, my brother has an Airbnb in Philadelphia and people don't think like, you know, Philadelphia is like a vacation destination, but there, it like a lot of people are coming through Philadelphia. I met people yesterday just in, in a, in the city, like traveling from California, they were going to this. Somebody came for the Taylor Swift concert, paid X amount. So if you have, an area where a lot of people are traveling to, and you have a specific reason, like the golf course is great. You, I, I didn't even think of weddings. Of course, there's uh, there's banquets and weddings and and people, and not just playing golf, but I'm sure there's hiking and all this stuff. So it really is cool to see how many different places that you can have an Airbnb and be successful at it. But I do understand the fluctuation in, in um, prices. Do you have specific, what months of the year are better for you or what, what ones are worse? I'm curious. Uh, it's fairly consistent outside of the summer months, which personally, I think it's so hot here. I wouldn't want to be golfing, but there's a ton of golf tournaments. So every single year, the, uh, U S kids open is in Pinehurst. Uh, so that's a pretty much guaranteed solid booking week. And then the house that I have, the, um, the golf course that the house is on also have the U S adaptive open, which is pretty cool. Um, so that happens every single year. So those are in July, I think in August, there's a lot of tournaments and then sometimes random winter times, there's also high school tournaments, but m- more often than not, it's pretty, pretty standard throughout the rest of the year. Can you give us a quick snapshot on, uh, like what you bought this property for and then what the gross is yeah. for the revenue in the year? Yeah. So I bought it for or 405. Um, I ended up doing about 50 K of renovation. Uh, so I did bathroom, painting the whole house, flooring kitchen i ended up uh just doing a backsplash and appliances but it was mainly like a full cosmetic renovation uh furniture was like 20 or 25k all in um so it's kind of a high-end really nice place and then right now it grosses somewhere between five five and a half maybe six on average with that month in july for example we'll do 10 or so uh and then the mortgage is about 2030. So it does fine. I mean, you you hear about people doing like five, six k on in cash flow on Airbnb. Mine's not doing that. It's it's probably averaging like fifteen hundred. That's still great though, dude. Yeah, I, mean, I was like, 
not to cut you off, but I, people have this, it happened during COVID. They have this idea that I'm going to buy two Airbnbs and retire, or like I'm going to make it a hundred grand cash flow on each Airbnb. And I, I say this because I just bought a, I just closed on a property in Tampa, Florida. And my goal, my goal is to make 500 to a thousand dollars a month. And like, that's well, it's super doable. And the reason I'm, I, I want that goal is because it's a lifestyle decision for me to be able to have to, a place to go to. I, I know it's a, a place that's going to appreciate significantly looking at net migration in the Tampa market. As long as I can hold on to it and not lose it, it doesn't, I mean, sure, I would love to make $3,000 a month. And some of my manager, my, the guy who runs a management company thinks he can make in that thousand to 2000 range, but I don't even care. So it's funny that you say $1,500. Like, that's great, man. You can't, Making $1,500 on a long-term rental is like, I mean, you'd have to have a really low interest rate. You'd have to burr it. You'd have a lot of things would have to go right. You'd have to maybe rent by the room. But I think the whole fairy tale of making, you know, six figures on an Airbnb at one point, people can do it. You can do it. You and you could do it. I just think now at a seven percent interest rate, it's like really, really really difficult. So, I mean, do you have anything to add there, Avery, on that? I was just saying that a lot of the times these people too will have the big. Um, you know, massive mountain home, a massive lake home or, or whatever, which is super cool. And people are spending seven fifty, fifteen hundred 1500 a night on these places. But it always worries me those a little bit just because I don't know exactly where the market is going for those type of properties. Because usually luxury vacation real estate gets it the hardest. I'm not saying that over time, if you're holding it, it isn't a big deal. But I don't know if I want to spend a million bucks, not that I could, on a, on a lake home. And then it just completely crashes um, from an appreciation perspective right away. And maybe people will stop renting it because it's too expensive a night. But then I hear on the other end, it's recession proof because three or four families can stay in these places. So I, I just get a little unsure about those specific Airbnb properties. And then I guess the only other thing to touch on, which you said was funny um, to me, because as you said, if it's in the middle of nowhere, it might do poorly. But my other Airbnb is literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's about 30, 40 minutes for me, but it, I think it does better than my pioneerist one. So it's a cabin on five acres in the woods, glamping state. I have a hot tub and a fire pit. There is absolutely nothing around it. No hiking. Uh, there's a really crappy vineyard, but people absolutely love it. And it's almost always booked up and it's, it's like the, the projections, that I had are not nearly as good as what it's doing. So that's that's awesome. And uh, so people are trying to escape, which is which is great. I mean, that, I'm I'm glad I'm wrong. Like I I think a part a lot of, a big of our portion of our portfolio is short term rentals in the the Pocono Mountains in in the PA. So it's mm-hmm. kind of and I guess you can kind of consider it's not really in the middle of nowhere though because there's a lot of there's a lot of commerce around, but it's like a typical vacation market for cabins and skiing and lake activities and stuff, but. It's funny that glam- the whole glamping thing is really big too. If you have a really nice product, people want to escape the city and and go there. So that's awesome. That just goes to show if you have a if you have a great product, people will come find it. So awesome, Avery. Um, like before we get to the end of the show, real quick, what are your goals in the next couple of years with your rental portfolio, social media, whatever it is? What are you looking to achieve in the next couple of years? Um. Yeah. So, well, I guess near, near term, uh, I have my detached garage, turn that into a rental. Um, I, like I said, I'm financially free. It's tough for me to say numbers wise, what the goals are because it's interesting and it's fun. I don't ever really want to stop. I think some of my girlfriend right now is doing her PhD. By the time she has a real job, I'd love to get on her health insurance and maybe no longer work. Uh, hopefully no one from my work hears that, but that's that's probably the goal for me right now. And then also, I'm actually in the process of getting my real estate license, hopefully uh, being able to represent myself and some friends on some transactions. I think just because I love talking about real estate, it'd probably be pretty fun. And I refer the guy that I've used down here probably to eight people. So if I could capture that, that would be pretty helpful. Um, so yeah, re- and just continuing to grow various income streams because really my whole goal is by the time I have a family, I, I just want to be a stay-at-home dad. So just capturing as much income before that happens is is the goal. In terms of social media, you know, it's it's cool some of the money you can make. I have a buddy who makes over a hundred grand a month. Um, he is absolutely crushing it. I don't. I, I was nowhere near that last year. I think I got to about forty-five or fifty grand for the year, which felt really cool. Um, 
but it is a, it is a bit of a slog like just making videos and I even before I started social media I don't think I posted an Instagram story in like 18 months so it's it's not something that's that natural to me anyway yeah uh the the, the social media game is wild it's it's a lot it just like anything it's more saturated now and a lot harder to do um I've mentioned this sometimes because my sister's an influencer and she was growing like it was a lot easier to grow on TikTok and Instagram a few years ago than it is now um but you can still make a lot of money doing it and we intend to continue to grow ours and and hopefully partner with new people and just meet cool people like yourself so core four I'm gonna get to that let's do it cool so first question the core four is Avery what is your favorite investing business or real estate book that you would like to maybe recommend to somebody who's looking to get started or just expand their horizons yeah, the one I always say is Set for Life by Scott Trench. I uh, read that, really liked it. He definitely was a massive hardo when he wrote that book, though. Uh, so there's some funny lines in there that I that I thought about since I first read it. <laughs> I never thought of that. I but... love that, and I love that I just listened to your episode where he was interviewing you and you called him a hardo. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. You said it to him. That's no, so no, like, he yeah. just called him a hardo, and he literally was just on his show. Well, three years ago, whatever. Yeah. But- Oh, you just listened. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that you're super frugal, super frugal guy in that episode I listened to. So it's actually kind of funny that you mentioned Set for Life. I think he is very like by the book, super frugal, like drive your bicycle to work, like certain things in it where you're like, dude, it's okay. It, <laughs> I remember have to like do not, everything crazy. Just I remember reading that book, thinking like, damn, there's some really great points, and 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 I would still recommend that to a ton of people. But I remember thinking like. He's like, yeah, and if you really want to save money, you can like eat beans or something. And I'm like, dude, come on. <laughs> like, that's not the way. But maybe for some people it is. I think the frugality can only get you so far, but it is the foundation. So uh, very cool. Great book. We've recommended it to a number of people. And sorry, Scott, we would love to have you on the show if you want to come on. But didn't mean to talk shit. Uh, that's great. No, no, I think it's good. He's that literally that type of guy. I don't think he would get offended. No, I don't hear that so. anyways, because he knows he's that. Yeah. By the book. Whatever. He wrote the book. Um, all right. Question two, if we cut you a check for hundred grand today, tax free, how would you spend it, invest it being where you are in your life and why? How would I spend, invest it and why I would probably try to find a small multi per, uh, cash out refi on it and then have that and then take that money and maybe do something fun. Cause I never do anything fun. <laughs> Have it, dude. It's doing fun stuff is hard to do once you get the the real estate bug. So make sure you, you know, do some fun every, stuff. Yeah, every time I get some money, I'm always like, ah, oh, I could do something, and then I'm like, well, it's not really producing any return. <laughs> but you yeah, and it's it like what it's you get to the point too, or and I'm not saying we're the, here by any means, but at some points when you want to do those fun things, the people you want to do them with are still stuck at a job, and you're like, damn, mm -hmm. like that's a great. Point. I now I just. Maybe I want to just teach everybody else how to do it too so they can come with me and do whatever we want to do together. I don't know if you ever feel that way, but it's. I think that's come not exactly to fruition for us, but at some points we're just like, well, what should we do? And we're like, well, we can only do it together. So what do you want to do? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's actually really funny. But we, li we had, I think, Mike Ayala on a few weeks ago and he mentioned, I think it was him that mentioned like he's never – heard anybody regret like saying yes to an experience or say like when you're older, like when you're in your fifties or sixties and not like old, but like older, you just look back and you're like, it's not like you think like he's a multimillionaire by the way, but he's not like, Oh, I should have made more money. He's like, Oh, I should have done more cool shit or I should have done. And he can still, ha can still do that. I don't even know if he's that old anyway. He's probably in his forties, but, but people were just saying he was talking about other people that are even more wealthy than him. It's like the mountain just gets bigger, bro. Like it just gets right. bigger and you want to attain more stuff and you want to get, you want to get more money. And then it's like, but when it's all said and done, like you got to train, almost train your mind to do the fun stuff where it seems like it comes naturally. But to me, it actually doesn't anymore. I have to like tell myself to do it. Yeah. But once I do it, I never, I never regret spending the money on it. Like where'd that money go? Went to a great experience. Awesome. Well, I think again. the fun stuff too for us now is actually like, okay, where can I get the greatest return? Or like what it can I fun. build and what can I create now? And like, once you know you're good at it or, or you've, you've gained a skill, you're like, all right, well, I'm just going to keep doing that because I, I, I don't know. It's, that is it's fun. Game. It's, that is fun. I totally agree with you. Like I was, I was thinking about that on vacation. I was just talking with some friends and like, we like talking business, but I was thinking like, like I'm talking about this because I do enjoy it. So I don't have to be afraid of that. Like that is fun. I was like looking at numbers on a spreadsheet, but like, I like it, you know, I don't have to be like, 
I mean, I don't want to be like spending every waking moment doing it, but you mentioned being a stay home dad. I'm really curious to follow your journey to see if you have the ability to do that and shut off, you know, well, not that shut off, not that shut at home. He'll yeah. be like, dude, I can do what I create and build up more income streams because I already have the skills, but I get to actually can't, if I want to walk away for a couple hours or whatever, or the whole fucking day or like a couple of weeks, he's got his kid right there. Yeah. Great. So I, I think it's a great goal, dude. It is. And that'll be more fun than you can think of. So you won't need to be start planning stuff. It'll hit you every day. So that'll be good. Um, Speaking like a new dad. Yeah. Spoken, <laughs> exactly. Uh, three. Three. That's me. Okay. Uh, Avery, what's been your biggest mistake in your real estate investing journey and how, or just life journey and how have you learned from it? Yeah, I, th I think it always happens every time I'm starting something and it feels a little bit of success, um, but maybe not success at first, at least in real estate, is I was just super cheap. We talked about being frugal uh, before I bought my first property. I was mad cheap, which was helpful. Um, and then when I got the property, too cheap, ended up fixing stuff a year or two later, you know, instead of uh, what's the thing that I think it's Rob Bill who says it, buy it. Um, not ice or buy it thrice for his uh, Airbnb stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just being cheap. I mean, same thing with my social media. People reach out to me about editing. It took me a while to say yes to the editing. It took me a while to say yes to someone to help with the funnel when I was trying to do it myself and I wasn't good at it. So it, it just speeds the process up if you can get people to help you, one, and then two, and specifically real estate, not putting in crappy materials so that it just breaks immediately. Dude, yeah, thank you. Our our property that our property that has the least amount of maintenance. Shockingly, we did all the work up front. Oh wow, that's that's a shocker. And we, you know, you spend more money up front, but you just like just do it right. Yeah, you just do it right, and you have to, especially if you're talking about Airbnbs. Like, forget about it, dude. You have to have the newest stuff. Not the newest stuff. It has to be um, everything that has to work. You can't have old yeah. shitty refrigerators and like it just doesn't I'm work. I'm learning every day the the phrase it takes money to make money. Like it it is a thing. Like you need to to set yourself up on the front end. And I'm theory, I'm kind of gonna bring it back to the social media stuff. Like you didn't want to spend someone to edit your videos. You didn't want to spend to build the funnels. It sucks, but to do it yourself and all the man hours that you're gonna take to do it and learn it and become a master, the master you need to be to stand out. It would be well better spent doing the real estate. Your your returns much higher. Look at the five hundred twenty five thousand dollars property that's now worth, let's call it nine, close to like, come on, that that one thing you did. I know, it was better than you learning how to edit videos. I'll just say that, right? Yeah. You pay someone to do oh, this, yeah. and then maybe you get a couple more people to buy your course, and the more revenue comes in. Like, it's just it's it took us a while because we're like, well, we're not making enough money, and it, to do certain things, to hire a VA to. To buy certain things and it's just like, or to even furnish our Airbnb the right way. We're like, we don't have the money to do it. It's like, well, we got to go find the money to do it, it out. spend the extra 15 grand. And now, wow, it's all of a sudden renting out way more than it was. Okay. Like, yeah. So it's like, just, you learn though, right? You every, you don't have the cash in the beginning. So you had to bootstrap, figure out how to get it. And just, I don't know. Uh, it's a good lesson. So yeah. Okay. Good question answer. four. Question four. So last question of the core four is, um, what do you want your legacy to be? So basically what gets you out of bed every morning to do what you do and what's your kind of motivation? Uh, I think I touched on it a little bit there being a stay at home dad. I just want to, you know, have a family where everyone can do what they want, where money isn't an issue. Opportunities are available for people, um, for family. Like, like there's no reason that you can't pursue what you want to pursue. So that's really my whole goal for a reason I want to make money. Uh, the other thing, Another motivator for me is before my parents get too old, I, I just want to keep taking cool trips with them. So having that financial freedom and time freedom, do some stuff. Like a couple of years ago, I went hiking in Patagonia with my dad. He's 69 now, but he was 66 at the time and he was running up and down the mountain. So he's still young at heart, but um, before they're too old, I want to keep doing that stuff. That one hits home for me, for sure. And that's part of the reason why I like, purchased a property in an area that I feel like they could be, I could send my parents at some point. So love that. Um, and I, I can feel you on that one. So last question of the show, last drop. And the last question is advice to your younger self. So I know you said you're 28. Let's say you can go back and talk to your, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 year old self. What advice would you tell 18 year old Avery? 
I think when I think about it in terms of going to college, uh, if I weren't playing sports, there's no way that I would have gone to college, but I'm also glad I went to college because I got to play sports. So I don't know if that's necessarily advice that I would take, um, but probably not worry too much about growing up too fast. I think I've always, people are always like, oh, you're so mature, you have you know, a good head on your shoulders and stuff. But uh, I wish I just, bad language, but I wish I fucked around more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so we, I've got kind of got caught telling people on the show, like, oh, you know, if you're going to get into a mass, if you're going to get into debt, I, st- I still don't believe college is necessarily the answer. But like, I think back, I'm like, dude, the only reason that we met was college. And I think, so like college does provide that networking aspect. I think that's the number one thing. The, uh, the, by a million. I don't remember one thing I learned in college in terms of, of, of school, but I remember like all these people are like my people. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, you have to get involved. Too. Yeah. Like, that, that was the biggest thing that I was told is like, all right, when you go to college, just get involved and do things because that's going to be one of the biggest assets for you. I was the first in my family to go to school and I, no one, I didn't even know how to apply and do all the stuff and go through it. I'm like, I, I guess I'm going, I was good at school. So I'm going. And I didn't know idea what I was going to study, figure it out. Then you get there and you get there. I'm like in my junior year, I'm like, dude, what the, like, what am I even doing? I'm just taking classes, but what I'm at to leave school in a year. What am I going to do? How do I make money? I don't know shit. You know what I mean? So you, you, then you start refocusing your classes. Like, I need to take business. I got to do this. You got to like actually think, cause you start getting that sweat. You're like, oh man, I I gotta, I'm going to be out of here pretty soon. But to Corey's point, I think the biggest thing for us was, or for me is, going through the experiences and meeting people and networking and, and kind of like for you, like playing sports isn't just playing sports, it's camaraderie building team, like competing with one another. And then that competition and, and kind of drive internal drive translates to the real world. Look at you. Like you're just pay, uh, uh, whatever foot to the pavement every day on the real estate stuff while still doing a job. Like not many people can balance both. Maybe you can attribute it to playing college soccer and also taking class and also managing relationships just so many things that we might not think about but it's through the experiences that we went through that kind of paved the way for us so i think if you're just going to school every day and just write you know taking tests and stuff it would be a waste of time right but for the experiences getting to know people getting to know yourself i mean you're 18 you're getting thrown into a crazy world and a lot of people jump into a city and moving away from family like they're just trying to figure it out you have no no one knows what they're doing so um that's a that's a hard debate the college versus not college it is it's tough i think it's if my recommendation is if you're not paying for it, then go. If you're paying for it, then you have a decision to make. That's kind of what it comes down to. And like, yeah, that's, you know, maybe a fortunate position to say that my parents pay for my college. I thank them all the time for it. I'm very thankful. I realize I come from a solid position where that can happen. If you're paying for it, you have to weigh it. What, you know, and I don't know how many people that are listening that are 18, but if you are, Shoot us a DM. I'd love to chat with you about maybe the decision if you're if you're into making one of those. But did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I was just saying I don't think I'm gonna say right off college. I think it has its place and it's useful. I just hated going to class <laughs> and I hate yeah. learning things that I didn't want to learn. Yeah. I honestly didn't even really like reading until I got out of college and then realized what I like reading. That's what I was gonna say. You met that's odd feeling back to the beginning of the episode because you were like, oh, I went to the library, picked up these books. I'm like, oh, this guy, you know, he must be- A bookworm. <laughs> yeah, a bookworm. He must just love that stuff. But I guess to your point, it's like, I I didn't like going to class either. I, mean, I thought it was stupid. Like, I, I didn't think it was stupid, right? But depending on the teacher you had, right? I'm like, dude, I could just go, if I have to read the book, I'm basically memorizing something, taking a test and then walking away. And then oh, forgetting yeah. it. I'm not just forgetting it after that just to get the A. It's the tangible experiences. Like we've, I kind of beat a dead horse here, but- um, to pick things that I like, I realized I was reading a lot of self-help books, real estate, income producing assets, and like marketing, just th- things that you kind of gravitate towards when you become mature to a certain point. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I was like, I just have to read and study. YouTube, right? The YouTube University. That's that's mm-hmm. our go thing. I know you're big on social on there, but there's so many things you can learn and get you light years ahead of, truly, I feel like light years ahead of where I would have been in college if I just friggin' put my grind face down and started studying. The key is you didn't know what you wanted to do back then. And that's oh. like what college helps. It helps, helps you figure out what you want exactly. to do. So we could, I could talk about this for, for an hour, but Avery, it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate your time. Um, and uh, it's been cool to get to know you. We seem like we're kind of synergized, same age, you know, same stuff going on. So thanks again. Yeah, it was great to be on. Like I said, I could talk about this stuff for hours. So Yeah, man, it was a pleasure. Thanks again. 
thanks for tuning in this week to the Weekly Juice Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and share with friends. The more ratings we get, the more ears we'll get on our show. And in turn, we'll be able to provide you with more high-quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod, where we post daily tips and tricks and document our own journey towards financial freedom. Make sure to tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice.